is recording, <laughs> thank you. That is the session that will um, bundle and summarize what DRW has done in this joint research project, um, focusing on the topic of renewable electricity and sector coupling. And I hope you can see my slides. Does it work? Perfect, thank you. So um, I'm doing this together with my fabulous colleagues, Carlos and Martin, who are already both there, I guess, in the, in the uh, video call. And I'll now give you first a brief um, intro to the background of DRW's part in the project. So, and which is also then uh, what, we, what we present in the session of this meeting. So the background of all of this, if you want to phase out fossil fuels, then naturally you have to phase in something else. And that is clearly renewable electricity, as we've also seen in the TU Berlin colleagues' presentations. But not only renewable electricity, but also sector coupling. So that's now, I guess, by now common wisdom that you make use of renewable electricity also in other sectors that are not electrified yet to decrease, to substitute fossil fuels and decrease emissions there. And here the variable renewables actually do play a major role that is wind and solar. And if you do use wind and solar, um, then questions of temporal flexibility and the related infrastructure needs uh, gain importance. And this is actually what we researched in our project here. So we have um, three strands of research going on. Uh, or you could also say it was like um, three working packages we did. So the first one is a conceptual analysis of flexibility and sector coupling on a somewhat higher level than what we've seen in the previous session. The second one is numerical analysis using our well-beloved and well-known uh, open source model beta. And the third working pa package or stream was empirical analysis of socioeconomic implications of selected energy infrastructure, uh, that is renewable infrastructure or uh, integration infrastructure. And actually in this session, we decided to focus that a bit. It was a really, I guess, a relatively productive um, project for us with overall eight papers coming out but we really wanted to focus here on only three in this session in order to give you a kind of deeper insight into selected project outcomes. And we decided to show you three little contributions of these first two strands, more high level conceptual analyses and numerical analyses. And actually, Paul, you <laughs> mentioned it's a bit of a risk when you do longer running research projects that energy policy changes in between and kind of depreciates your assumptions. In our case, we are a little bit more on the safer side because our analyses are such high level or on such a high level that um, even meanwhile increasing ambitions in actual policy doesn't matter very much because we rather aim to illustrate and discuss more general effects. So what can you expect in the next, uh, I guess, 70 minutes that we have left? So that's what we do right now, in briefly introduce the session. The next one is then um, a little contribution uh, very, in very general terms. What is the role of electricity storage when renewables increase and when at the same time sector coupling enters the system? Then we have a second paper presented by my uh, colleague Carlos focusing on the power sector effects of a very specific sector coupling technology that is battery electric vehicles in scenarios with fossil fuel phase out. And third, we have a more methodological contribution when you move towards very high shares of renewables and you want to model that, then uh, you usually have to make use of some constraints to actually enable these high renewable shares and 
some of them can trigger unintended consequences in the model artifact, which Martin has spent a lot of time on investigating and which has implications for energy modeling that may be interesting to the wider energy modeling community. And if we then have a few minutes left, I will quickly run through some other project outputs and briefly advertise the other five papers that came out of the project here, um, just to mention them and to let you know where you can find them. <clears throat> and I must apologize, my voice is a bit, um, it's, it's even less pleasant than it's usual, usually, um, because I'm a bit, I had a bit of a cold and still didn't fully recover. I hope you can still hear me well. If there are no questions at this stage, I would right jump into it and um, move on to electricity storage and the renewable energy transition. So um, this is this is a genuine outcome of this project, and it has been published, I think, nearly exactly one year ago, in the form of a short uh, article, which is actually a bit of longer commentary article with an appendix in the journal Jewel. And the main idea here is to, I, I briefly summarized and uh, separated three strands of the storage research literature and to aim to illustrate in relatively general terms how storage use actually changes when you have increasing shares of variable renewables in your system and if you go for sector coupling. That is, if you do a fossil fuel phase out, which was the focus of this very project. And in order to do these illustrations, um, I found it really helpful to look at residual load duration curves. And as we will also see some more of these beautiful curves in the next talk, I thought I would briefly introduce them here. So residual load is the electricity demand minus the potential renewable generation at the same point in time. So that gives you the remaining electric load that has to be served after you already accounted for renewables. And if you calculate that for, let's say, all hours of a year, and then sort them in descending order, then you get residual load duration curves. And here is an illustration. So the dark blue line here, that's a setting without any renewables. That's your then just the load duration curve. And then you have, I think, 20, 40, 60, 80, 90% renewables and then your residual load duration curve actually moves down but and that's the one of the basic properties of variable renewables it doesn't move down in parallel but very much on the right hand side because wind and solar uh, are generating in similar periods and because of this same time generation you get then increasingly hours where you have more renewable generation potential that you would usually use or need in your traditional power sector. Um, and you still have on the left hand side periods where you have to cover the residual load. And obviously one prime strategy to deal with this is electricity storage to move parts of these surpluses here to the left hand side. So where do, these, um, where do these graphs come from? We generated them with a very stylized version of our capacity expansion model beta, um, which we calibrated for Germany. You can say this is really a bit of a toy model, but I guess there are some people in the audience who would find this fun. <laughs> you can actually download this model and um, play around with it. In, um, uh, there, we just put it on Zenodo. You can also find it on our Dita GitLab. Um, account and uh, there you can generate such graphs and, and related things. And that's actually what I then also used for this, for this little, little article to generate these stylized um, uh, 
these, these stylized uh, residual load duration curves. So electricity storage as a prime source of flexibility and getting the renewable energy uh, integration done. Well, there are various technologies for this. And I've been working in this area for quite some time. And I can really say there is a breadth or a continuum of uh, storage technologies, some quite exotic, others well known. And we certainly don't have a shortage of electricity storage techs. Um, but uh, importantly, they have they, they differ in terms of uh, relevant techno-economic parameters. That is, most of all, the round trip efficiency. So how much electricity do you get out when you put electricity in? And what are the costs or the specific investment costs related to both the energy capacity and to power? So uh, megawatt and megawatt hours. And this typically gives rise to different duration storage types with different E to P ratios. E is energy, P is power. And you usually have uh, short term durations the, the technology such as batteries because they're relatively costly in terms of energy and uh, longer duration storage. So typically you think about hydrogen based storage there just because the energy related or specific costs are much lower there. I don't want to go into detail, but it's clear with electricity storage, you can do a lot. The focus is often on bulk electricity storage, just shifting el electricity, that is renewable electricity across periods in time. But you can also do other things various ancillary services, reserves, capacity related uh, uh, storage values, or you could uh, <coughs> relieve distribution or transmission grids. And in fact, um, often storage can at least to some uh, extent combine such applications depending on the market design and the regulatory environment. But it's also important to note that there are competing flexibility options. So electricity storage is just one of them. First, there are power to power options like demand side management. So when you can shift electric loads over time, that has the same effect as electricity storage. And there are some you could classify as X to power. That is you flexibly operate dispatchable plants for example, bioenergy. And then there is a group we call power to X, and that is sector coupling. That would be new and flexible loads, for example, power to heat, but importantly, no electricity flows back there. So this is just a flexible new load. And finally, there is geographical balancing, which also helps to integrate renewables just by balancing deviations in renewable availability and load over larger areas. So what does the literature say about electricity storage? Let's first look at systems without sector coupling. And there it's kind of common sense now that storage needs or optimal storage deployment remains fairly moderate until you reach renewable shares that are fairly high by at around 80% plus minus X, depending on your system. But also many studies have shown that uh, the storage needs then substantially increase when you move from around 80% to really fully renewable settings. And especially the storage duration then increases a lot. So the E, e to P ratio increases. And obviously it depends on whatever other sources of flexibility you have in your particular system. And here is now the, uh, the beautiful residual load duration illustration I announced. Um, what do we see here? This is um, a load duration curve. So all hours of the year, this is just normalized relative to peak load. And for a kind of medium setting with 60% renewables, 
which we should achieve fairly soon, as we discussed in the previous talk. Um, uh, you see here that for a stylized German example, again, it's all very stylized just to generate, uh, illustrate general effect, we would see that we have quite substantial renewable surplus, like, I don't know, 1,500 or so hours, where you have actually more renewable uh, generation potential than you would need in the pure power sector. And then in the optimum, given assumptions on which storage technologies you have and how expensive they are, there would be some optimal storage use, shifting some amount of energy from here to there. Maybe two important points. You would never take up the whole renewable surplus just because electricity storage is costly, both in terms of energy and power. So there's always an optimum and you would rather curtail some fraction of renewable surplus. And what you can also see, this is not fully or to not only to a minor extent shifted to the very peak uh, demand hour, but the bulk of this is actually used in hours where residual load is relatively low. And that is just because you would need much longer duration storage to move this yellow part here. And it's just cheaper to move it there. And in the 60% renewable world, there's just no necessity to do otherwise. But we can say in such a setting, making good use of a part of the renewable surpluses on the right-hand side of this residual load duration curve is driving storage use. This changes if we go to 90% renewables. <clears throat> what you can see here is first, uh, the residual load duration curve shifts down and renewable surplus generation massively increases and also storage use increases. But importantly, storage use is now much less driven by, by making good use of these surpluses but much more by actually uh, covering part of the residual load that is left to be covered. Because in a 90% renewable setting, if you have this binding target, you somehow have to uh, yeah, satisfy your residual load. And so the driver for storage really shifts from the left-hand side of the residual, uh, from the right-hand side of the residual load curve to the left-hand side. Then you can have a look what happens if uh, sector coupling enters the picture. And sector coupling means you have other types of energy storage related to the sector coupling, for example, heat storage or uh, storage in the, in the form of vehicle batteries or hydrogen storage, chemical storage. And that can help you then to increase the demand side flexibility of the system at relatively low cost compared to electricity storage. And this obviously could then mitigate the storage, the electricity storage needs, especially if you're in a setting with not such a high share of renewables. So here, this what is new here is this red thing. Again, a very stylized example. So we added a very flexible sector coupling technology to this oil model with um, an electricity demand slightly less than 10% of what you have in the traditional system that comes on top, let's say for flexible power to heat applications. It comes with a fairly high power rating by assumption and it doesn't need many full out hours, only around thousand. So this is a flexible generic sector coupling technology. And what happens is this makes use of most of these uh, surplus, renewable surplus energy. And that is why it nearly completely substitutes electricity storage needs in this setting. So the yellow area disappears. Interestingly, this effect vanishes if we go to a 90% renewable setting and with the same sector coupling, stylized sector coupling setup. So this, if I jump back one slide. So if you look here on the right-hand side, this picture is nearly exactly the same as this one. So hardly any change. Why is that? Because on the one hand, this additional sector coupling is relatively small compared to the renewable surplus, but on the other hand, it doesn't by design contribute to uh, covering residual load on the left-hand side of this curve. 
Well, and then you can say, let's go for 100% renewables. And let's also see what happens if we would then massively increase sector coupling and make it massive and flexible. And first general point I want to make here, if you move from 90 to 100% renewables in this setting, your storage needs really strongly increase. I think the energy capacity you need increases by a factor five to six, just because it's now necessary to cover the whole remaining residual load. But the point here in terms of sector coupling is, even if sector coupling is super flexible by assumption, it just doesn't help you here on the left-hand side by design because it doesn't generate electricity. That means also that it does hardly or not at all change your need to have electricity storage because again, in such a setting, this is driven by the left-hand side of the residual load ratio curve. And the one technology that actually might change this is electric vehicles, because there you have both a flexible load and potentially also feeding back electricity to the grid. That's why we have the next presentation in a minute that will nicely uh, take over from here. But let me add this. Um, actually, it's not only that uh, flexible sector coupling does hardly mitigate your electricity storage needs. It can actually also make things much worse if it's not flexible. So if sector coupling uh, is also required to draw additional electricity in these hours, then your electricity storage demand actually increases. There are uh, nice graphs illustrating this in the appendix. So the moderate and high level conclusions are first, for the time being, we should not be concerned that electricity storage is somewhat of a barrier for renewable deployment, and we should certainly not slow down renewable deployment because of a perceived shortage of storage. At the same time, it's now really clear that long duration storage technologies become key for achieving high variable renewable shares. And that is why I argue this should really be the focus for research and development, but also for deployment and incentives for market up, uptake, um, really focus on long duration technologies. And the third very important point, sector coupling is there and it's there to stay. And we should really work on making it temporarily flexible by sufficiently investing in, in related energy storage technologies that are not electricity storage, but heat and hydrogen storage, but also by working towards non-distortive charges and tariffs that actually let market uh, actors make use of this flexibility. And, and a moderate or modest conclusion for energy system research, I would argue that research on power sector only is largely over. We now really have to take this, the sector coupling uh, options and technologies as an integral part of our models. And one particularly exciting case is battery electric vehicles, which is um, now the bridge to the next um, talk by Carlos. But maybe before we go there, I would um, open up the floor for questions of understanding or uh, comments if you have any at this stage on, the, on these little intro slides I just showed. I can see Paul and Francisca, so I think Paul was first. Or can you unmute yourself? I think I can. Hi, can you Hi. hear me? Cool. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, I have like a bit of a question or maybe also rather a comment. Um, so I think the sector coupling that you showed, um, I, I, I assume like one intention of sector coupling would also be like to shift um, the residual load duration curve, not just to use it um, like within the curve, as you showed, like as some means of um, like reducing curtailment. But of course, um, there will also be some flex fl flexibility, like when will I load my car or when do I use my heat pump? And then I can basically also like affect the curve and then the results still might be a bit different. So well, that, that is actually what happens. So this is everything is here endogenous. So 
this is already the result of what you've seen that these sector coupling technologies draw electricity whenever it's cheap, that is whenever you have renewable surplus in the first place, and they already do shape this residual load duration curve. But the point is they don't help on the help on the left hand side if you don't have um, electricity flowing back to the system. Okay, I, I might have to think about that for. I'm happy to answer any follow up yeah. questions later on. Okay, um, thank thanks. You. And Francisca. Uh, yeah, thank you. As you know, boys, I had a steep learning curve on Vita in the last two weeks. Uh, um, and, and there's one question that I still have, um, and maybe this is the occasion to ask it. Uh, you said it's really a stylized model. Um, and I, I learned you don't use um, a data set, let's say, for the European system or some individual um, uh, European country system. So I wonder um, how easily your general, uh, general um, sort of stylized results are transferable to, um, to individual uh, yeah, European countries, for example. So elsewhere, probably, um, because systems are pr pretty different overall, not just in terms of the current status of the system. You, you want to go for large share renewables, anyways, in, in your um, scenarios. But um, other sectors, uh, let's say that this, the, the heating sector, uh, can be very different. Right? Member states, uh, Eastern Europeans have a lot of district heating, um, Western Europeans more individual home heating, um, but also the renewable um, uh, potentials can be very different. Solar potential, etc. So, how easily can you um, sort of apply your results to relatively different countries? Mm -hmm. And sort of related to that, do you plan to make it more of a European data set uh, um, that's you know very geographically specific mm -hmm. weather data and all these kinds? Okay. Of things? Thanks, Francisca. Uh, that's it's a good opportunity to clarify. So, this little toy model, a very stylized model, I've just shown, that is also very stylized compared to our larger Tito model. And it's by design meant to just illustrate these general effects. And I would also claim what you can see here is also fairly general in nature. Sure, you can plug in some other time series of some other country, <laughs> and um, then it looks slightly different. But in general, this is a yeah, very generic approach of illustrating effects. Then when it comes to our more detailed um, larger scale data model, then you're totally right. When you do this, you have to decide on the kind of level of detail you want to go for, and then not only the various renewable uh, generation potentials, but also different uh, demand profiles and different sector coupling related uh, demands and idiosyncrasies of different countries come into play. And that is then what every <laughs> modeling team has to uh, decide how detailed can you do this. Um, yeah, but then that is then actually a question for the specific um, country applications you do then. And maybe you have in mind our other <laughs> running project. Um, so we can also bilaterally follow up on that one, how detailed we are there. But in general, I would say our data model is by design on a fairly high level compared to more detailed uh, power sector and grid models used for more nearer term policy relevant um, applications, we rather go for a higher general level of insight, I would say. Okay, thank you. Then it's time to move on and, and hand over to Carlos, um, who actually should get the largest um, chunk of uh, uh, time in our session. <laughs> but I see I already uh, took four more minutes than I should, I'm sorry for that. But Carlos, don't feel pressurized at all um, and take the time you need. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Wolf. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me see. Can, can you see? I think it's a uh, full, full page, full screen. Can you see the, the presentation? Yes, it looks good. OK, thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to present today um, the research that we are carrying out with Wolf as well, uh, related on battery electric vehicles and, and, and the flexibility 
charging strategies we are modeling at the at the beginning. I think the presentation is gonna last 20 minutes. Um, I think the first 10 minutes I'm gonna explain explain mostly the, the details related on, on, on the configuration of our uh, scenarios. And then the, the, the next uh, 10 minutes, I'm gonna discuss the, the results. So first of all, um, I would like to, to, to mention the, the background of, of our search that um, the power system uh, flexibility, um, we can find different alternatives uh, in terms of flexibility and uh, for sector coupling. But uh, particularly, as uh, both mentioned in the previous presentation, the battery electric vehicle offers, of, offers some particular features. For example, it provides a, a higher demand since the number of electric vehicles may increase in the future. But this demand could be also flexible uh, and additionally could provide some source of storage if we consider the option which is vehicles to grid. So in, in our research, we have the following question. Uh, the first is, what would be the effect of the battery electric vehicles uh, in the power system, taking into account a medium and a high renewable shares? So the second question is, uh, what dominates the additional demand or additional supply of, of flexibility? And in this case, uh, the key question is, uh, because to read, uh, what was the role that may play this technology or this uh, configuration, let's say. Um, the contribution in this research is mostly related on, we use uh, MOPI, we develop this tool in order to generate time series of battery electric vehicles um, that enables us to, to, to provide a insight of, of the, 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 the consumption of electricity, the grid demand that I'm gonna explain later. And, um, the other uh, tool that we are going to use is, of course, uh, the DTER model that uh, we mostly work together in, a, in our research group. And a new uh, Python wrapper we developed, we call it DTERPy. So I'm going to explain more about that in this, in this slide. So first of all, I'm going to try to put the, the pointer, if you are able to see it. One second. Mm -mm 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 pointer option here, I think Lasser. Yeah, with the pointer, I would like to explain uh, what Emopi does. Um, mostly produce four different time series. The mobility, which consists on um, uh, producing a time series that provides you or gives you at every time um, a time step in the location of the vehicle and the, the distance traveled when the vehicle is moving from one point to another. So the second time series takes into account the mobility, the previous one, and calculates the energy consumption associated with the distance travel, but also the variation of temperature through the year in order to fulfill the, the comfort of the cabin if it needs more heat or cooling. Um, once we have the energy consumption time series, we are able to allocate uh, different charging points. And we call this time series charging availability that consists on a different location. It provides or distributes charging point with different uh, power rating. And, and then um, the model is able to, to define if at some hours where the vehicle is in some particular location, can charge the vehicle and fulfill the energy demand or uh, delay the, the charging. So that helps us uh, using this charging availability. But in fact, we can generate at the end uh, the grid demand. The grid demand is the time series that tells us what is the energy, the electricity taken from the grid, ac the actual energy. So the difference I would like to highlight between the charging availability and the grid demand is that the grid demand is the, the actual electricity taken from the grid and the charging availability is the capacity available at the charging point for a vehicle, depending on the location. And, and then um, we can decide, we as a user or the power system model can decide at which point can charge or eventually discharge. So the second, um, the second uh, graph here um, or blocks um, describe a little bit what is DTER pipe. And actually in the core has uh, GAMS, uh, the, our DTER model and interact with Python in order to uh, process the input data and generate some 
visualization and deal with the scenarios. So, but the most important part in our research are the different charging uh, strategies. So the first charging strategy we are, we are considering, we are gonna consider three charging strategies. The first is the inflexible battery electrical. This we call it inflexible because we are using the grid, the grid demand of 40 uh, vehicles profiles. Um, so we have the, the, the conventional electricity demand plus the grid demand associated with electric vehicles. And Dieter take the decision in terms of investment of batteries and generative technologies. But in this case, Dieter is not able to allocate the charging because we are providing that information through the grid demand. That's why we call it inflexible battery electric vehicles. The second uh, charging strategy is a smart grid to vehicle. In this case, we provide again the 40 time series, but uh, we provide the driving consumption, which is the energy consumed by the vehicle at different point in time, and the charging availability that gives us the, the, max, the power rating uh, at different point. So in this case, Dieter is able to allocate the charging time of the vehicle in order to fulfill the energy demand, uh, at the same time, the side investment in other technologies. In this case, what we get from this smart uh, grid to vehicle is the charging time series after, uh, after Dieter decides the most optimal decision. So in this case, we can, we can say that the, the decision are optimized or system optimized, the charging decision. And our third um, charging strategy is the vehicles to grid. So we provide again the energy consumption of the vehicle, but also the charging availability as an input and detail decide the charging time and also the discharging. So in this slide, I'm gonna provide some more little detail about uh, our um, generation of the energy consumption, the grid availability and the grid demand. So in this case, we take into account uh, different types of drivers, for example, uh, non-commuter, which are uh, free person who do different activities through the day and commuter with mostly are related on, on, on working uh, uh, people who uh, commute every day for different places. And the destination we take into account six different destinations that you can see there. And we took the statistic. Also the graph shows the, the, the frequency taken from mobility in, in Germany, 2017. And for example, this graph provides the frequency of the departure time uh, depending on the destination. So for example, here we can see that the working place for commuter is very high in the morning and then after uh, in the afternoon, the destination are mostly related to home. So some other element is that we consider four different models of battery electric vehicles and we consider models like Tesla, Hyundai and other models that you can see. So in general, in the case of uh, Dieter, uh, we already know that it's a power system model that is based on minimizing the total system cost. And, and what we consider here in, in this particular uh, setting is um, we have a, a green fuel um, a scenario by 2030. And in this green field, we have um, renewables and are set as a lower bound in our variables and fossil fuel technologies that are set uh, as an upper bound in our, in our system. I have to say that, however, that in gas generation, we leave it freely in order to not constrain when we have a very high number of electric vehicles, that means a very high demand of electricity. And in, in, in the case, if we don't leave this uh, gas generation as a free, we are forcing to invest mostly in renewables when the demand is, uh, is very high. So we can see what, what we can get from in from the results. So this is the last slide related on our our presentation uh, of details, uh, and then I'm going to explain the results and are the scenarios. Uh, in this case, we have uh, developed 192 scenarios. Um, we take into account eight different numbers of electric vehicles from zero to 40 million, uh, four different carbon prices between 40 and 160 and uh, three connect, uh, connection strategies that are the one that I, I have already explained and um, two minimum renewable share 
65% and 95% of renewable in the, in the system. So here is the first uh, slide of uh, our results. This uh, graph represents the total system cost. And in the X axis, we have the total number of electric vehicles in the, in the fleet. So this plot has a uh, subplots, which are uh, allocated in columns and in rows. And for example, in columns, we can see the carbon price. And in rows, we can see the renewable share for 65% and 95% here. So one of the first, uh, in terms of colors, um, the blue color represent the, the smart charging, which is the grid to vehicle. Uh, and the dotted line is the vehicles to grid. And the red one is the inflexible charging. So the first thing that we can, we can take from this graph is that the, the, red, uh, the inflexible charging always um, has the highest uh, total system cost. Uh, in all the scenarios and increases while the number of electric vehicles increases. And in the other, in the other uh, case is that the vehicles to grid shows the lowest total system cost in all the scenarios. But the interesting thing is in, a, in the configuration of higher renewables of 95%, we can see that the total system cost in this uh, kind of charging strategy is even lower than the, the situation of zero electric vehicles. So that's a, it's, it's very, very interesting from this, from, this, from this graph. So I'm gonna focus particularly on this uh, carbon price, um, 80 euros as we are considering as a default um, uh, configuration. Um, and we are gonna analyze this, what is the, the investment difference based on the zero electric vehicles uh, scenario. And uh, we have here in the, in the columns, the subplots, the, the smart charging, and the vehicles to grid. Um, the first thing that we can see here is that, for example, in vehicles to grid, we have a higher uh, an increasing of investment in gas turbine. And this case is the open cycle gas turbine, and also some other uh, some other uh, storage like lithium ion batteries. Uh, however, here we don't see the investment in natural gas when we consider the the vehicles to grid option. Actually, uh, while the number are higher in terms of uh, vehicles, the investment de decreases in comparison to the serious scenario. So uh, in some way, one conclusion that we can say is that the, the, the consideration of big, uh, vehicles to grid also reduces the investment on, on, on gas turbines. Um, if we, when we look at here, uh, the configuration of 95% of renewables, we can see here uh, also that in this case, we have investment in storage and, and also natural gas. As we have 95% of renewable, of course, the, the, the impact of fossil fuel technology is not very high in comparison to the 65%. But we can, what we can see here with the configuration of vehicle to grid is that uh, immediately, soon after one million, three million electric vehicles, the, the, the lithium ion battery is, uh, is, is not considered actually, it's not uh, uh, being an, an alternative of storage for the configuration. Uh, we are seeing here. And it's, it's also interesting that decreases also the investment on, on, on long-term storage, which is hydrogen, and increases the solar generation. So we're gonna focus in order to explain more these, these effects that we can see here. Uh, I'm gonna provide you now um, a residual low duration curves for this configuration of 10 million electric vehicles. Uh, for the 95% of renewables uh, scenario. So this, this looks like the, the low, uh, residual load duration curve. So the red color of the residual load duration curve um, represents the difference between the conventional demand minus the renewables variable generation. So in this case, it's wind and, and, and solar photovoltaics. However, um, there are other sources uh, that um, are part of the demand at some time, which is the demand of the electric vehicles and uh, the demand of the batteries for charging. 
So what we can see also here in this uh, load duration curve is the zero line. Below the zero line, we can see is everything which is request charging, charging load is energy that is taken from the grid. Uh, above the zero line is the dispatch of different thing, generating technologies that uh, produce electricity in order to fulfill the, the load, uh, residual load duration curve. However, we can see also some technologies that produce electricity uh, beyond the residual load duration curve. That is because there are some technologies here that requires electricity for charging. In this case, the red color represents the hydrogen and, and the, the, the blue light color is the lithium ion battery. Finally, I am explaining little details about this graph because uh, mostly both us explain uh, the, the, the big uh, details, but uh, in order to, to understand better the colors here, I, I am focusing on some other. So this region are the region that uh, is the surplus of renewables. So all the charging associated allocated here uh, are taken from the curtainment, avoid the curtainment of electricity. This uh, purple color is still the curtainment that we have in, the, in this scenario. So what we can uh, highlight here in this case, how, however, is that the, the location of uh, smart grid to vehicle, smart charging, the charging of the vehicles are lo allocated in this area. So somehow uh, consume or avoid the curtain of, of renewables. However, there are some here in this region also charging the requirement of electric vehicles uh, because the, the, it's inflexible. I cannot be allocated all the charging alternatives here in the, in the, in the surplus of renewables. That's why some other technologies provide that, uh, that uh, demand that has to be fulfilled here. Um, what we got, want to highlight in this, in this graph is that uh, we can see hydrogen and lithium ion battery as well. Um, so when we change to the scenario of 10 million electric vehicles, but, 90, um, but the vehicles to grid, in this case, we can see clearly that the, the charging of the electric vehicles is in this region, increases substantially, and also the electric vehicles may provide the flexibility and provide electricity in order to fulfill the, the residual load duration curve. Um, the other thing that we can highlight here is that the investment in, in lithium ion battery is no longer there. So and, uh, at the same time, the investment on uh, hydrogen storage uh, is half of the one that we saw before. I'm gonna go back once again to show you the, the effect that you can see that using the vehicles to be reduces uh, the need of, of storage. So in this slide, uh, represent the, the emissions, total emission of CO2. And we can see here in this slide that again, the, the inflexible um, scenarios, inflexible charging uh, increases the emissions while the number of electric vehicles increases in different, uh, different scenarios of carbon prices. But what is interesting also is that when we change from 40, uh, euros a like ton of the carbon price to 80, it decreases uh, the, the emission decreases substantially. No? And what is interesting here is that this increase on the carbon price uh, obviously uh, um, produces that the coal generation is no longer the most economic alternative and is not uh, invested. However, when we increase the, the carbon prices, it, there are no uh, significant redu the reduction in the emissions. Um, and again, the, the dotted line that represents the smart vehicles to grid uh, always actually reduces the emission of carbon prices, even though, even when we consider zero electric vehicles. So that is uh, very relevant. So I am reaching to the last two slides um, before going to the conclusion. And this slide, I'm I want to, to, to show an example of how are the, the, the charging uh, depending on the week and every hour in the day. Um, this graph represents the, the times of the day 
uh, the charging in, in gigawatt hours, but also um, show us the, the, the different charging strategies. Uh, this one, the green one, I would say, represent the um, inflexible demand. And that's interesting because it shows the lowest uh, load in comparison to the other, which is the grid to vehicle, the smart charging, and the vehicles to be. Uh, however, we have seen also that the results are the worst in terms of total system costs and, and carbon emissions. And uh, somehow we can explain that we have an inflexible charging the system. It's not uh, the allocation of the charging is not system optimized. And we can see that there are charging uh, through peak, peak load time. Um, in the case of uh, the smart charging, we can see that also in the vehicles to lead that the charging decision are allocated most, mostly in solar generation time uh, in relation to the generation of solar photovoltaics. Um, and uh, the, the other effect is that we have some variation, high variation here in between uh, that represent the generation of uh, wind that also leads to, to charge at different hours. And in this graph, uh, what I want to present is the, the configuration of vehicles to grid and what happened with the charging and discharge. Uh, and we can see the charging we have already discussed in the previous slide, but in this case, uh, the discharge, we can see that the discharge is higher at peak flow time and remains almost constant or decreases very slow through the night. So that's that's a very, very interesting uh, findings. And uh, in this last uh, plot, uh, I combine both together in order to see somehow the, the effects of uh, seeing them together. So um, in the conclusion, um, the flexible charging and the vehicles to be substantially reduce the system cost of the system cost, cost and, and promote the integration of variable renewables. The flexibility benefits uh, of the battery electric vehicle can outweigh the demand effects uh, in high renewable settings. And the vehicle to, to it can substantially mitigate the electricity storage needs. So, in conclusion, um, as a policy, policy market should work on enable flexible battery electric vehicles charging and vehicles to grid option. And the complementary carbon pricing remains important, mostly to discourage the investment on coal. So some of the limitations and the future research are, for example, um, the real world barriers on vehicles to read is a user acceptance and also the distribution grid issues. Um, we would like in the future to consider several other European countries in order to, to see the, the interconnection between the countries and what does affect um, the total system. And ideally we could be able also to consider all this, all the sector coupling options. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Carlos, for this great talk. And if I may add, so I'm biased, I, I'm a co-author, I found it great. <laughs> but even without that, thank you very much, Carlos. Very nice and I think very clear. Um, and let me add that we are working on a paper and hopefully there will be a preprint like fairly soon. So this is actually the last paper we do in the project and it's not quite finalized yet, but um, we're working on it. And I think we can still take the time to take a few questions. <clears throat> I'm not sure who was first. Let's start with Sebastian of PIC. I think Martin was first, but I think. Um, just a very quick question, just probably a clarification. So in those figures with the um, emissions, when renewables are 65%. So, and, and you and you told that, um, so there is a huge uh, drop between 40 and 80 euros per ton, but not too much reaction 
to very high carbon prices of 120 and 160. Uh, why is that? Is, is it because you are fixing renewables to 65%? So, I mean, demand needs still to be met and then you still use, you need to use fossils. Um, otherwise you will have unmet demand or why is that? Um, I didn't get well the, the, the question because you mentioned the, the reduction in em emissions uh, from 40 to 80 in the crisis, and then you related the, the total system cost, no? Uh, no, I no, no, um, oh, no, okay. you, you can go back to the other slides. Okay. I think everything would be in this slide. Basically, yeah. why aren't emissions reacting that much uh, to very high carbon prices? So there is not much decrease between 80 and 100, 160 euros per yeah. ton. Why, why is that? Yeah, this is mostly because uh, to, to be able to, to displace uh, the gas generation, which is the next other technology that uh, uh, can, be, can be replaced by the storage, for example, uh, we need higher uh, carbon prices than 160. Obviously, uh, this. Oh, sorry, Carlos. Yeah, well, please. Just to add, sorry, we want to interrupt. Uh, this, um, Sebastian, obviously, this also depends on your assumptions on the specific costs of the renewables themselves and of the long duration storage or stationary storage technology in the water. So, given this kind of medium parameterization we chose, there is just not too much uh, an effect of um, on the renewable share. I mean, the renewable share increases and strikingly it increases even more with the extra grid that helps additional renewable market entry, but you don't get the fossils out like completely in this parameter setting with 160 euros, which is probably not an exclusive result to our study, but has been probably found in many analyses that to get then really to completely renewable settings, only driven by a carbon price, you really need very high carbon prices or very, very cheap renewables and storage. Yeah. And just to be sure, so you are not fixing renewables in those scenarios. Okay. One clarification, what we put is a minimum uh, renewable share. So actually um, I, can, I can go, I think I have a backup here. Let me try to find what is the, yeah, the actual renewable share. So even though, for example, we are setting 65 as a minimum renewable share, ah, we can minimum. see that the, the system may uh, consider some higher uh, renewable share. So that occurs mostly in the 65%. In the 95%, it remains 95% for all the scenarios. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think um, there is a thunderstorm going on, an awesome yeah. thunderstorm. Yeah, okay. yeah. Maybe you hear it in the background. That's um, interesting. Um, Martin, do you want to ask your question or do you rather want to present and uh, make up a few of the minutes that I kind of wasted in the beginning? Uh, I think I would like to ask my question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, the, the same question as Sebastian. I, I found it a bit surprising that there was yeah, no strong reaction for, for uh, carbon price levels beyond 80. But I also had another question. Um, I, I find it super interesting how much um, uh, this flexible grid to a uh, vehicle to grid option, how much that contributes to the integration of renewables and how much it also affects the portfolio of uh, storage and other flexibility options. So basically we don't need that much of all these other technologies once we get um, vehicle to grid in the system running. Um, you, you had a, um, what, what I found surprising was that uh, largely photovoltaic was, uh, or the optimal investment into photovoltaic increased um, due to the category, yeah, exactly here. I was wondering, is, is this, as we can see here on the right, is this due to the fact that there is an overlap between the PV generation profile that, that has this peak during the day um, and the use of uh, uh, battery electric vehicles or why, why, is, why does the model prefer PV over wind in this case? 
Mm, that, that's a difficult question, actually, because we have several technologies included in this uh, in this analysis. Um, so um, I think mostly the the, the system try to allocate uh, depending on the availability of resources, and in this case, it's clearly that they prefer the the solar photovoltaics instead of wind. But I I, I that's. It's some, somehow also related on the, the demand, no? the, the demand of the conventional, uh, the conventional demand, let's say, and, and the additional sector coupling, which is in this case charging the electric vehicles. But uh, yeah, I think that that's actually, I don't know, Wolf, do you have some I think ideas? It's, it's fair to say uh, many analyses have shown that PV goes hand in hand with short duration storage because you just need this limited temporal flexibility shifting from daytime to evening late largely especially in these settings we have here and this is just what electric vehicles do they are essentially short duration storage options with big to grid and that's why you also see clearly that they substitute the stationary uh, short duration storage so clear competitor of vehicle to grid and stationary lithium batteries so and that that is why I think it's quite natural that you see the PV increasing there. Um, I also see we have one more question. To which extent would electric freight transport change the results? <clears throat> this is an interesting one. You've seen it in the chat probably. And let me tell you, we, we, we are working on it together in a, another project with the EFOI Institute and some other partners. We are actually doing a similar analysis like this one for electric rate, but not only battery electric trucks, but also with catenary overhead lines and how that actually changes or what, what changes this does trigger in the system. And hopefully also by the end of the year, there should be a preprint on that one. So stay tuned. <laughs> that is um, then really new um, in terms of the underlying transportation demand profiles, which are very important there and which are very detailed in this other project. So We'll, we'll keep you updated if you like. And I think now it's Martin's turn. So Martin, you still have the 12 minutes and I can cut down on my planned advertisement block in the end. That would be the other five papers we did in the project, but that is also something we can distribute uh, in some other way. So please Martin, uh, go ahead and the floor is yours. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. So um, thanks for that, Wolf. So after having heard now many uh, insights on the actual transition on, uh, of the energy system, I would like to uh, dive into particularities of modeling, um, more precisely renewable energy targets and a modeling artifact called unintended storage cycling and its implications on uh, energy modeling. Let's dive right into it. What we see here is a simplified power sector model with a conventional generator with variable renewable generation with a uh, storage capacity and demand and this thick line represents the grid. So it's a simplified power sector model. What we expect to see in case there is a surplus uh, of re variable renewable generation that cannot be accommodated in the system by either storing it or by consuming it, uh, we expect this excess electricity to be curtailed. However, if we now impose a minimum renewable share, for example, of this form here, total or annual generation from variable renewable generation has to exceed a certain share of demand, we might run into unintended effects. And, and these unintended effects um, are the following. Instead of curtailing this uh, surplus of generation, uh, it gets fed into the grid and then erased from the system via additional simultaneous charging and discharging of the same storage capacity. Um, and this charging and discharging then generates additional unintended storage losses that in the end uh, erase the, the additional generation from the system. 
And we call this effect unintended storage cycling, which can be observed in the case of simultaneous charging and discharging of the same storage capacity. However, um, this simultaneous charging and discharging uh, is considered excessive because only the net effect of both um, actually matters to the to the uh, energy system balance. So um, that's why it's a yeah unintended effect. So unintended storage charging, just to uh, uh, wrap it up, is essentially a curtailment, uh, a conversion of curtailment into unintended storage losses. So what are the research questions that we looked at? Well, first of all, uh, what is the effect of the modeling artifact on model outcomes? And then second, what are possible solution strategies? We also have further questions that we elaborate on in the paper, but due to uh, time constraints, I'm not gonna talk uh, about those. So what did we do? Essentially, we uh, investigated uh, a large number of possible configurations of a minimum renewable share. Um, the this most decisive attribute of, of these were um, the degree to which storage losses have to be covered by renewables, SLCR. Keep this abbreviation in mind, you will see it later on again. And our three variations are the following, either zero SLCR, meaning that storage losses can be completely covered by conventionals, proportionate SLCR, meaning that storage losses are distributed among renewables and conventionals according to the minimum renewable share, and complete SLCR, meaning that storage losses have to be covered by renewables only. Um, we use a stylized version of our uh, well-established and beloved power sector model DETER, which is a linear capacity expansion model. Here in our case, we, uh, we had a setting that uh, yeah, optimize one region loosely parameterized to the German power sector with a limited technology portfolio wind power solar or midterm storage and conventional generators. And the results that I'm gonna show you applied for a system with a minimum renewable share of 80%. So let's look at two settings, one with unintended storage cycling occurring and compare that to uh, uh, a setting without the artifact occurring. And what we see if we look at these generation profiles is that first you can observe the artifact happening by, uh, by simultaneous charging and discharging in the same hour. So we see that they have here, 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 and so on. Um, and if we compare that to a setting where the artifact does not happen, it's either discharging or charging as we see over here. What we also see is that it's not only storage that has been affected, but also other components of the system. So for example, here we see some uh, coal generation, which does not appear in this other setting, or also, for example, curtailment of wind over here is largely affected by uh, the modeling artifact. So what we can observe in the end is that Unintended storage cycling is an artifact that very often occurs in our stylized setting on average every fifth hour, more or less. Um, and we can see that in those settings where uh, storage losses have to be completely covered by renewables, the artifact does not occur at all. Whereas in all those settings where uh, storage losses can either be partially or completely covered by conventionals, so those. Um, the artifact occurs. And what we also observe is that apparently the artifact has a cost decreasing effect, right? So total system costs decrease in those settings here. Why is that? Well, these are uh, many results here. Let me just highlight the most important ones. First of all, um, this cost decreasing effect results from a decrease in optimal uh, generation capacity of renewables, which are quite costly. And why is that? Well, as I introduced you at the beginning, unintended storage cycling essentially converts intended curtailment into unintended storage losses. And it does so by um, realizing additional um, generation from variable renewable generation sources 
without uh, the need of, or, or this increase can, can be realized without additional um, uh, generation capacity, right? And it, it essentially, uh, yeah, it essentially generates additional renewable generation with, without additional capacity. And this basically then uh, decreases total costs. Um, likewise, due to the decrease in optimal generation capacity from renewables, also the storage energy capacity, which might be costly, decreases as, as well. Um, since this additional generation from renewables is not used to serve final demand, but erased from the system via unintended storage losses, um, the generation from conventional sources even increases if the artifact occurs. Uh, and what we also see, of course, is here this increase in storage use due to the artifact. Um, what we also see is that the curtailment is decreased. This is essentially just the artifact uh, occurring as I introduced at the beginning and the occurrence of uh, unintended storage losses. Well, maybe a side effect, but it's still important due to the increase of um, generation from conventional generators, we see an increase in uh, emissions, which to some extent counteracts the intuition of imposing renewable energy shares or binding renewable energy shares. Um, we conducted many sensitivity analysis, maybe just let me highlight one here. What we see here is a system with an 80% renewable share and 100% renewable share. On the left-hand side, we see uh, generation, then we have the electricity grid storage use, and in the end, uh, end energy uses, so curtailment, final energy, and storage losses. And um, what I want you to understand from this um, uh, figure here is that with increasing renewable shares, unintended storage cycling marked here in red and unintended storage losses dramatically increase, right? So uh, going towards a renewable, um, a fully renewable power sector or energy system, the, uh, the extent of or uh, well, the, the effect of the artifact actually increases. So let me wrap up. Uh, we have seen that unintended storage cycling has a significant effect on model outcomes. Um, the solution that we recommend is uh, configuring your renewable energy constraint in a way that renewables completely cover unintended, uh, completely cover uh, storage losses because then this conversion cannot relax the constraint anymore. Um, we also have seen in the literature that there are alternatives to solve the problem. However, they all have their disadvantages, either being uh, uh, not ensuring a certain renewable energy share, uh, such as these two options here, or also uh, they, they come with the downside that they cannot actually model binding renewable energy share targets, um, which are commonly used in uh, climate policy all around the world. And maybe let me then highlight in the very end that unintended storage cycling is just a special case of uh, unintended energy losses that may occur uh, in more sophisticated settings uh, with, for example, sector coupling. So uh, wherever there are inherent losses that enable cycling or that enable additional energy losses, this uh, effect may occur, which uh, basically, yeah, uh, shows that this artifact is important to a wide range of uh, energy models. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, looking forward to questions and discussion. Thank you, Martin. Also, thank you for being very clear and concise. And we have now 11.45, but I think we can still take two or three minutes for um, questions if there are any before we take a little break and then move to the other room. So let's see, are there any raised hands? In the meantime, uh, let me add, we have a um, preprint out on this. So as you mentioned with Martin, that um, if you like, and read in very much detail what's now.
not been presented very briefly. Any questions, comments, remarks? Okay, if not at this stage, then um, let me say we have the, I guess, more policy oriented panel discussion in German upcoming in um, 15 minutes in the other room. I guess you all have.